what does a pharmacist do? Well, most people might answer that a pharmacist dispenses the medications that my doctor prescribes. Now, I work with a ton of great pharmacists, and one thing that I don't generally see is excitement about pills in a vial. And this is probably because pharmacists have been trained to do so much more. So what can you get excited about in your community? To find out, let's go beyond the scripts. Hey, welcome back to Beyond the Scripts. I'm your host, Will Tuft, Director of Education at Pioneer Rx. So today is kind of a neat episode because when we talk about independent pharmacy, there's so many ways that we can kind of define what makes independent pharmacy special. So all of those things that independent pharmacies excel at just naturally from their connection to the community, whether that's being able to spend extra time and making that patient connection, uh, really knowing what's going on with your patients, meeting your patients where they are at home. So many of these things that pharmacists just do on a daily basis at independent pharmacies. So another thing that we hear a lot with independent pharmacy is how do we get paid for all of those things that we do in a pharmacy? So independent pharmacy is really almost synonymous with what is now called enhanced services. And so today we are going to dive deep into enhanced services. And we have really one of the community pharmacy leaders in enhanced services and helping people implement those into their pharmacies. Today we have Cody Clifton from CPESN joining us. Cody, welcome. Well, thanks for having me on to your great podcast. Thanks. You're too kind. Let's keep that uh, that <laughs> that energy up, man. <laughs> so, how are you doing this morning? Doing well, thank you. How about yourself? Oh man, I'm 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 here. <laughs> Always good. <laughs> like a roller coaster on this journey. So, just gotta hold on tight. Yeah. So, uh, what what's your official title? My official title at CPSN USA is the Director of Practice Transformation and Clinical Programs. Okay, that sounds awesome. What does that mean? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> in, in case it's a lot of different stuff, including building websites. So one thing I never thought I would be doing in this role, but um, a few of the different things that I'm involved with that really fits under that title is uh, really helping pharmacies transform their practices. As you said, independent pharmacy is synonymous with enhanced services now. So with that, um, there's this huge practice transformation effort that is going on. It's guiding them in how do I even start this journey in this very busy uh, practice that I'm in. And I don't, I can't think about anything else but rights in front of me, but they know that this is the future of pharmacy and they're all on board. So it's exciting to work with them on a daily basis and the network leaders in that, in that way. And then on the clinical program side, I'm leading the COVID-19 vaccine program partnership with the CDC. So that's taking a lot of my time right now, but it, also it's working with pharmacies to succeed in payer programs. So payers are recognizing pharmacies for all of these enhanced services that they're providing to their mutual patients and members. So it's really cool to help guide the pharmacies on how to document some of those services in technology platforms like Pioneer RX. So uh, really exciting to help guide them along the way and be successful and get paid for all those great things that they're doing with the patients. Wow. Okay, cool. That's a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, like, like I said, that's really key is, you know, a pharmacist can fill their day doing amazing things for their community. Uh, but you have to be able to, you know, keep the doors open and, and keep the lights on to do that. And so you have to be able to get paid for that. So you have to be able to bill for that. So you have to be able to quantify that. And that's really, I think that's the key with enhanced services. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but. You're spot on. We've been doing a lot of these things for years and years, but how do we actually show the payers that we need to be paid for these services? Because it's contributing to the healthcare system so much. And so we need to the community pharmacies need to be uh, having a return on their investment for all the great work they're doing. Yeah. So is there like a CPESN elevator pitch or, or definition? You know, if you're stuck in the elevator with somebody from a uh, uh, another area of healthcare or, you know, outside of healthcare, even, and they're like, what are enhanced services? You know, uh, how do you pitch that? How do you explain that quickly? 
Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, so enhanced services are going above and beyond of just dispensing the prescription. So that is the touch point we have with the patient, but everything that surrounds that is the enhanced services. So this is things that we're doing to take care of that patient as a whole. So maybe it's uh, maybe the patient's having transportation issues. So we're delivering medications to the patients and that's overcoming a social determinant of health, which is very important to payers. Um, there's so many other things around the appointment based model, especially through COVID-19 that we're all exploring now and getting uh, schedulers and everything built out and uh, offering those services in that way. So. Uh, it can be a variety of different things, but ultimately it's just making sure that we're caring for the patients so that they have the best outcome possible for whatever their condition is that we're trying to help them manage. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, with enhanced services, I feel like that's something that um, I don't know. Once you give something a name like that, like now it's a thing we have to do. Um, and, and I feel like that almost creates a bit of a barrier of entry where it's like, no, 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 like this is already what you're doing. It's kind of the same thing we see with the, the term, you know, clinical pharmacist. Well, every pharmacist is a clinical pharmacist. Yeah, <laughs> you know, definitely. it's <laughs> there's there's not like a, a new thing. You just need to be cognizant of what you're already doing almost. Yeah, yeah, there's so much opportunity in everything that we're already doing. I mean, you do have those enhanced services that may go above and beyond of those that we're used to doing. So maybe we're now getting more involved with point of care testing and making sure that, of course, with COVID-19, the testing around that has exploded in community pharmacies, but maybe we're focusing on influenza testing or strep testing or UTI testing. So there's a plethora of things that and services that pharmacies are providing already today. And then there's this next level of services kind of going above and beyond those basic level services of enhanced services to, to provide more for those patients in the community. Yeah. I want to circle back to um, point of care testing in a bit. Um, so I, I think that's one of the really exciting ones in the, in the next couple of years. Um, so you, uh, you're a pretty young guy. Not not too, too far out of uh, pharmacy school, and you landed uh, someplace really, really neat, probably kind of a, a, a household name in, in the world of independent pharmacy. So tell me a little bit about that transfer from pharmacy school and, uh, and the time you spent out in, uh, was it the Concord location? Yep, Concord, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. So thanks for making me feel better. Uh, I feel pretty old these days, so hopefully I'll channel that energy <laughs> for feeling young. But yeah, I landed in Moose Pharmacy, so I'm originally from Walnut, Mississippi. I'm sure you've heard of it. Just kidding. It's 900 <laughs> people that live there, so it's a very, very small town. And I started out working in a community pharmacy there in Walnut, Mississippi. Uh, my family is blue-collar workers and uh, really – provide a lot of support along the way and making sure that I'm fulfilling my dreams and what I want to do and had an opportunity to start at a pharmacy where I walked to to work. Um, I had a car, but I lived probably 900 feet from that independent pharmacy. So it was really cool to start out there, really got my interest going in the community pharmacy. And so as I transformed through pharmacy school, I had that community pharmacy feel. You know, you've got people going into ambulatory care in the clinical setting within the hospital, as they say. And so I was feeling those pressures of going somewhere like that. But I knew deep down, I always want to be in a community pharmacy. So that's really where you build those relationships and stuff with those patients to, to make true impact. And so then it led me to Moose Pharmacy and searching for uh, opportunities and residencies. Yeah. And and with the residency opportunities, there's so many out there that that people more than likely don't know about um, in the community pharmacy sector. And Moose Pharmacy is uh, at least whenever I was going through it, and I think it is still now, one of the top community pharmacy residencies out there affiliated with UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. And so was surrounded by such great thought leaders at Moose Pharmacy with Joe Moose and Ashley Branham, Erin Dalton, who's been a guest on your show before, um, even though she's moved on and uh, in Savannah, Georgia now, um, just surrounded by all these great people and the innovation. And it's like, since I've been at Moose Pharmacy, the innovation has not stopped. It's just 
kept going and kept going and really leveraging all of those great relationships to make sure that we're improving the patient's outcomes, which is the the, the best part about everything that we're doing uh, within community pharmacy is making sure we're caring for those people in our communities. For sure. For sure. So you said something kind of interesting, you know, when um, I think a lot of people when they're in pharmacy school are drawn to those other specialty areas, right? Because those are the exciting areas. I don't want to go to a retail pharmacy and just fill and bill. I want to go to ambulatory care. I want to go do something really kind of outside where I think fundamentally um, there's kind of a, a shift in like, it's not just fill and bill in retail pharmacy anymore. It can't be. Um, so it's, it's really neat to see that, that same kind of like focus on, on doing all the exciting stuff in retail pharmacy. Like it's, uh, it, it's not your, your grandpa's, uh, retail pharmacy anymore, you know? Right. And community pharmacy is so much different than retail pharmacy, as they say. So community pharmacy is just that community of people. And that's where people love to go to because it reminds them of something with their family or their community. And they know that they're getting great care, but yeah, with, with getting started there at Duncan's Pharmacy, I, I started out, they weren't offering immunizations back in, I think it was 2008, maybe, whenever I was there and started working on their, uh, maybe it's a little bit after, it was after that, maybe a couple years. Anyway, we started the immunization protocols and everything and started out with MTMs and stuff. So just bringing something different and diversifying your revenue is so important, as you mentioned, Will, um, in everything that we're doing within pharmacy. And, and then taking that experience and apply that at Moose Pharmacy to start new programs like pharmacogenomics and and uh, transitions of care uh, services that we were offering at Moose. So really, really cool experiences. Nice. So it sounds like kind of that first uh... Uh, foray into enhanced services was immunizations, which in 2008, 2009, that was still pretty, pretty new in, in the world of independent pharmacy. So um, how did how did that start? Did you did you approach the owner or how? Tell me a little bit about that, because at that point, you're the new guy. You're like, hey, I'm the new guy. Let's change things. How, how did that go? <laughs> so I was a cashier. And um, at, at the time, I started out in high school. And I guess going forward a little bit, it was a few years later than 2009 because I just realized that's when I graduated high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it was uh, a few years later when I was in pharmacy school. Gotcha, and gotcha. I had been a, a cashier there. And Jim Jackson is the owner there and a wonderful guy and a family friend. And so he was like, uh, Cody, are we really going to think about getting started with immunizations? And we were really thinking through like all the, the processes and everything. And I was pretty green at the time, still am to a degree, um, and trying to get services started there. And uh, he, I mean, again, I think it goes back to that relationship and trusting someone. And he was like, okay, we'll go for it and see how it goes. And so now they're, they have a clinical pharmacist there. Just like you said, Will, everybody's a clinical pharmacist these days, but she's focused on so many different things uh, with the immunization program and MTMs and diabetes education. So just having a launching pad if for pharmacies out there that aren't doing services that are considered enhanced at this time, it's the way to go and you've got to get there quickly. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So um, it, it's it's cool. Uh, we we kind of talked a little bit um, off air that, you know, a lot of times when I interview somebody, they, they have the same story arc of like having this passion, going through pharmacy school uh, and then kind of serving their time in a retail big box. And and that's like a uh, where, where they just kind of spool up this. Um, excitement for something bigger than just fill and bill retail big box pharmacy and, and so there's like this kind of holding pattern where they identify that passion um, but it sounds like you're able to just come right out of pharmacy school and just keep your foot on the gas with that excitement and move right into uh, an independent that really lets you flourish with that and that's pretty cool not everybody's able to you know have that kind of opportunity to just hold that passion 
Yeah, I'm super. I think it's all about the experiences that we have. And so they have really the opportunities and everything has set me up for success from day one. And all the mentors, just surrounding yourself with mentors and, and thought leaders and people who have done this and learn from their mistakes and learn from how we can make things better. So I was definitely uh, at, at Moose Pharmacy in an environment that allowed me to really fail forward, as Joe would say. And so failed quite a few times before. Um, I won't lie about that part, but it's something that we pick up and we get up and we do it better the next time around. So he was good at letting us fail and fail forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's another thing you see a lot of, you know, at, uh, well, no. Nobody comes on the podcast. Nobody goes on to social media to talk about their failures. You know, they, they talk about their success and it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's easy to forget that. Yeah. Sometimes you try things, you, you know, I know pharmacists, great pharmacists who have opened a second store and had to scale back and, and move forward. And, you know, it's, it's not always easy. Um, so when you're at, uh, at Moose Pharmacy, when you started there, what enhanced services were kind of like already in place? Were there some that you had to adapt to early on? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So Moose has a very, very nice adherence program that people model across the country and uh, and all. Um, at about six weeks into my residency experience, funny enough, Erin uh, was there for about six weeks and she was about to leave. And my co-resident resident there at the time, Shannon Rudolph, uh, we were offered two different projects um, to, to get started with. And hers was a patient care project and mine was a technology project. And it was about electronic dispensing devices and working that into workflow. So of course, um, I didn't, I wasn't very uh, thoughtful about the future. I was excited for that time right then. And that project, Shannon got to do her direct patient care experience at one time. And then this project followed me around. So we always joke about um, choosing which project when we first started out, because there's a lot more coming after that. And so uh, that was really cool to kind of take that adherence program and uh, start out with electronic dispensing devices and learn through a lot of different things. And it was hard and we failed sometimes. And then we got back up and did it again and did it better. So I think that's one of the things that has helped me along the way is to to do these things in this test environment with these people around us, like starting the electronic dispensing devices and then go from there. So that was something that was um, uh, already established. And then we brought that electronic dispensing device to life. There was transitions of care programs happening, working with care managers. Uh, pharmacogenomics uh, was something that I got to start there at Moose Pharmacy uh, and nice. did a few of the encounters, which is really cool um, to do during residency and stuff and really see how that affects patients and help and helping them decide what medication may work better for them versus something that they're currently on. So cool to see that. And that was a passion of mine at the time. So lots of uh, other great services at Moose Pharmacy that we were offering, but those are some of the ones that really stick out in my mind. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And what's cool, like you said, is like some of those are really, really cutting edge. I feel like pharmacogenomics is still pretty, pretty new. That's like the cool stuff we should be doing in, in 2021, like uh, really looking into custom, uh, customized medications and, and digging deeper into that. But then some of the enhanced services there are just like second nature. Like when somebody talks about adherence packaging, I'm like, you know, I always just kind of think like, what would moose packs do? Right. Uh, which is what they call the, uh, adherence packaging at, uh, at, uh, Joe's places. So what do you see as like enhanced services, like services that you could be offering that are really cool. And if you want to find something new, awesome. What do you see as not really being an enhanced service anymore? These are essential services. You need to be doing these. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to pretty much the standards that CPSN has for pharmacies for the enhanced services. So immunizations is baseline, right? We're in COVID-19 and everyone's giving immunization. So if you're not giving them, uh, it's time to get on board with, with the immunization train so that 
all of this public health initiative that's about to happen um, a- around other vaccines that have been missed and stuff during the COVID-19 is going to be an instrumental role for pharmacy soon. So immunizations, uh, medication synchronization, comprehensive medication reviews, something that has been a mainstay for quite some time now and just working that into workflow is so important. Um, and then I think one of the ones that is uh, coming up that's uh, considered a enhanced service that's not done by everybody, but everybody could benefit from offering is delivery. So that's something that um, uh, we've talked about at CPSN of being a very valuable service. So I think at baseline, uh, those services there are just the basics that all pharmacies should have going right now. Yeah. And and I feel like all of those services – like if you weren't doing those in 2019, by the end of 2020, uh, 2020, you kind of had to be because on a curbside model, you have to get those patients in and out efficiently. So having, you know, a curbside or delivery model, well, if you're doing that, you really need all their medications together at once, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'll, I really feel like 2020 should have you know, solidified a lot of those as essential services now. Have you seen like an increased adaptation? Like, okay, yeah, let's do that thing we've been putting off. Oh, yeah, there's been a lot of that. Um, That was within Flip the Pharmacy that I know we'll probably discuss in a little in a little while. Those pharmacies have been through that where we really focused on that appointment based model. And and that's where we're going um, as we start a new uh, group of Flip the Pharmacy participants is really focusing on medication synchronization as the baseline. And there were so many testimonials uh, as we got started with the COVID-19 vaccines, the testing, um, and all of, all of that. Uh, and they were like, if we didn't have this as a baseline service, there would be no way that we would be able to manage our workflows. And we've gotten testimonials about people starting that, that medication synchronization process because of them recognizing the value that it provides to the workflow. Mm. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, with the um, other enhanced services where like you have to schedule an immunization, you have to schedule that one on one time. I mean, it really just kind of makes sense to have that that workflow that's controlled. Um, So if you're at a pharmacy that's not doing any enhanced services, you're just kind of you know, maybe you're a small pharmacy, you're still telling yourself, oh, our patients don't want MedSync. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you're just not doing any enhanced services. Uh, what do you think is the easiest enhanced services to set a goal to say, you know, it's, it's September now, we're moving into October. By the end of the year, I want to be close at least to you know, having this enhanced service, having my first enhanced service, what's a good place to start? You've got to start with MedSync or else you can't go, you're, you're dead on arrival if you don't, because then you can't do any other enhanced services. So I think the, the baseline and back to the basics is always MedSync. Um, it's just to me a, a no brainer because you want to be able to control your workflow versus patients controlling your workflow. And you said um, about pharmacies that may uh, not really want, they think their patients don't want to do MedSync. The patients don't know because they don't know it exists and they need you to help them know they need that. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of those things, you know, and it, and it feels like almost every podcast now I tell this story. I was in a pharmacy that told me, oh, our patients don't want that. While I was there, somebody came up with a little seven day pill organizer off the shelf to buy that. And I'm like, your patients want med sync. They want adherence packaging. They're going to do it themselves. Like that's how bad they want it. Um, okay. So once, once we get a little, um, med sync happening in the mix, um, what, what do you think is the, the next goal to set? Is it a percentage of med sync? Is it maybe bringing in a new, uh, a new offering once we kind of have some patients on that appointment based model? What, what step two? So one of the, the goals that we communicate to the pharmacies is, and I'm sure you could probably back this up or have another stat on it, but about 40 to 50 percent 
of your patients need to be on MedSync. And I know at Moose, there was probably about 70% at Duval Family Drugs. We got up to about 50% theirs. And it really does make a huge difference in order for you then to start changing uh, and adding more things to uh, your enhanced services plethora. Nice. Nice. So um, you spent a lot of time at Moose and like Moose, obviously great example of enhanced services and standardizing those enhanced services into their workflow, uh, which is key. If, if it's something you go back and do later, uh, there's a really strong possibility that, you know, the urgent's going to overshadow the importance and, you know, it's, it's not going to get done. So it seems like integrating into the workflow has been really critical there. Uh, then you spent some time at another pharmacy uh, out on the West Coast that actually has a bit more of a uh, opportunity in enhanced services because you have the uh, provider status in Washington. So tell me a little bit about that experience. So that was so cool to see uh, in Washington State there uh, all the great things that pharmacies can do because of the provider uh, status there in Washington State. Um, with with going into the pharmacy there, uh, Serena, who's a huge fan of yours, Will, she, we had whenever I was going into the pharmacy, she would say, OK, Will's got something new for us today. We've got to watch it. <laughs> So you were you were a celebrity at uh, I'm sure in many pharmacies, but I know at Duval Family Drugs you certainly are. Um, so whenever I would get there, uh, we would watch some of your videos and stuff, and uh, I was like, Serena, we've got to be able to like more manage the workflow here. So when I got there, what was really cool is I learned all this stuff at Moose Pharmacy and was able to bring that to Duval Family Drugs, and really recognize the efficiencies and opportunities. And so at baseline, when I went in, I was like, we've got to get rid of this, this and that. And Serena, I think, wanted to run away the first day. And Serena is this phenomenal technician there. She t turns herself as director of operations. And so I think I was kind of getting her territory. So she didn't like it too much. Uh, but she went with the flow and everything. And so we we revitalized the medication synchronization process there. And then we started really honing in on the staff roles. So that is so important to all these enhanced services and for opportunities that you can get involved with with provider status there in Washington. And so um, we, we made sure that everyone was practicing at the top of their license. So that's one thing that I think is another big takeaway. If pharmacies aren't letting their staff practice at the top of their license, then they're going to be stuck in a rut for a very long time because it's going to take everybody on the team to get these enhanced services going and delineate responsibilities so that we can provide all this care. And so with that, we uh, after we got that ironed out, we started getting more into um, the collaborative drug therapy agreements there at Duval and, and making sure those were ironed out. So of course we were doing naloxone counseling and dispensing that and then birth control prescribing, which was pretty cool um, because they weren't at the time, they just passed this in North Carolina, but at the time um, they weren't doing this in North Carolina yet. So it was cool to get involved with that. Um, and then, Moving into strep and flu, COVID testing, uh, all those point of care testing opportunities that are just waiting to be uh, grabbed, especially now when people, as we go into the fall, aren't going to know uh, what, what's wrong with them out of the three big uh, focus areas as we get into the fall. Um, and then, of course, there's a huge barrier with provider status in a state, too, uh, with getting credentialed. Uh, so that was one of the big things that I worked on getting myself credentialed and carry the pharmacist owner there. She was getting credentialed and a few other pharmacists and stuff. And so there's a, there's a huge uh, leap there to start billing for those services. And so that's where technology platforms, making this as simple as possible for the pharmacies is going to be so important to help overcome this. So they do have provider status there. Um, but I know you've spoken with uh, Ryan Oftero from Kelly Ross before, and yep. they're really into the provider status realm there in Washington state focused on HIV and PrEP and things of that nature. But it's hard to uh, translate that to chronic care right now because you're having to do all these other things in workflow and um, it's not the easiest to get documented and build and set everything up. So I think it's it's starting to get there, but there are certainly 
uh, a lot of hoops to jump through as you think about it with everything that's going on in the world today and how busy the pharmacies are. So as provider status, it's so much opportunity to get paid differently for services. But again, there's so much already that we're doing that we can get paid for. So those two things aren't synonymous, like the enhanced services movement and getting paid for those enhanced services and then getting paid for provider status. Those are right. a lot different. Um, and so I think as soon as if we get over COVID-19 pandemic and whatever that new normal may look like um, for those pharmacies that can get credentialed with insurance companies early on through provider status, if their state is offering that, it's going to be so important for the success of, of getting other services started there that you can directly bill for. Yeah, for sure. So it's it's definitely one of the exciting frontiers in, uh, in community pharmacy. And like, like you said, there's so many different variables. So, you know, every state's different. Um, and then even the, the roles of technicians vary so widely. Um, and then there's challenges with credentialing, but, you know, um, like, like we were saying earlier, it wasn't that long ago that pharmacists weren't able to provide basic immunizations. Um, I feel like within COVID, we really saw those opportunities though, where independent pharmacies can, can fill those, those holes in the healthcare system. And so like being paid as a provider, Okay, you're you're providing the immunizations, but what about flu season here? So if you're going to do that point of care testing, can you prescribe the solution if they do test positive? Um, I think that's an easy win, you know, uh, that just makes sense. And where do you see those changes? You know, are, are you seeing those changes becoming more commonplace or at least being brought up to the table as, as conversation? Yeah, most definitely. Um, again, COVID-19 uh, is the pandemic has been tough for everybody, right? But there are silver linings in uh, the work that we're doing to provide for the communities and and then also for the sustainability of diversifying your revenue. So not just focused on prescriptions. I think this is really a launching pad for community pharmacy to offer all of these other great services and get reimbursed for it. And, and practice at the top of our license and push for more. And so I think with the flu testing and the strep testing, um, that along with the COVID testing, that is an easy, easy, uh, it sounds easy, uh, but that's an easy way forward after we make it through um, all of this this next uh, wave of, of boosters and stuff with COVID-19 is to switch and focus on, if you're not already, flu and strep testing if you're and and prescribing those medications if your state allows it. I think it's just a a huge launching pad here because the public, we've got the public behind us now. They know all that we can do, especially with the the government tapping us on the shoulder and say, hey, it's your turn. So the yeah. opportunity's here. Yeah. So we definitely saw um, you know, a highlight on the uh, ability to provide immunizations and then Kind of the, the, the enhanced services that I'm really excited about that was really kind of, you know, didn't have a whole lot of adaption. You saw it in some places, but the point of care testing, we saw so many point of care tests for the COVID-19 in the past year or two, and it's really become commonplace. Um, you know, I saw the Binex um, COVID testing like at Walmart. Uh, on, on a center cap, you know, like when you're walking through the aisles, it's like, that's really progressive. Like, you know, to think about where we were 10 years ago. Or even Will, like a few months ago, right? So yeah. whenever we first started out uh, with COVID-19, everybody was like, okay, we've got to get tests, uh, the COVID-19 test in and everything. And it was such a hard thing to get. And it's just crazy to see how, I guess, everything has progressed so quickly so that you can, like you're saying, you see that on the end cap now. Like it's just, I, I've never, and I've only been in practice for five years, but it seems like this, everything has just happened so quickly and it's just progressing everything along. Yeah. Have you seen any like interesting payment models to go along with that new service um, for point of care testing? Uh, we had a, a webinar the other day on the COVID uh, reimbursements. You know, we're seeing some 
some payment models roll out and, and pharmacies get made whole on some of those. But um, what about the actual testing? Yeah, so a lot of the testing is cash-based right now, unless it's, um, of course, with COVID testing, there's this easy way to, to or a, an avenue at least, to get paid federally if you bill for that to the insurance companies. With flu and strep testing, for instance, in Washington State, it could be cash or you could bill it to the insurance. So that's where the provider status opportunities come into play. So in order to make that maybe something that's more appealing to the consumer or the patient out there, offering this test as something that we can bill toward your insurance is something that can occur. And so, but that is limited though to what state allows for provider status in certain certain realms and opportunities there. And then um, I, I know there's quite a few grants that is going on right now that are really focused on how do we like jumpstart the payment opportunities with point of care testing. But for the most part right now, it is really focused on the cash model. But hopefully, I mean, you never know after things die down with the COVID pandemic and HHS is already opening things up a little bit more. Hopefully this provides us another, another opportunity to serve the communities and be reimbursed through, through the payers. For sure. Because now, uh, you know, the government is, uh, concerned with the next wave of COVID, of course, but also at a time when people are generally vulnerable to the flu, which is this, I, I think this year is going to be another, the past few flu seasons have been really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one's going to be kind of a, kind of a, a, like, let's see what happens. Is this going to be another year that says maybe we've eradicated the flu <laughs> or yeah, is yeah. this going to be like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think that's going to be so interesting to see how this plays out. You're right. Like, it seems like a guessing game um, because last year it was like, oh, what's the flu? Almost, right? Like, it was right. still very important, but because of people wearing masks and uh, washing their hands finally, um, people were a lot more cognizant of those uh, safety measures to prevent the flu. And now, People are getting a little bit more comfortable, even though we're now in the height of the Delta variant and stuff. So, but yeah, I agree completely, Will. It's going to be interesting to see how this year's flu season plays out. And also, last year, everybody was getting, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people were getting immunized against the flu because they did, they knew that was going to help with COVID. And so there's a little bit less emphasis on that right now. So are people going to get the flu shots based on last year's trends of the flu not really being that bad? Right, right. And the fact that flu shots make your arms magnetic and the government tracks you <laughs> through those. Is, right. is that problematic? Don't want to get too many chips in there. <sighs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, this is a lot for one pharmacy who's got patients coming in and out the door to kind of keep up with and, and to, you know, hold themselves accountable. If only there was some kind of group that they could join, some kind of group that maybe had an acronym as the title. Um, is, are there any groups that may assist in this uh, that you could think of? Yeah, it, it's coming to mind. I may need a minute to think about it. <laughs> no, I, I think the acronym may be CPESN. So, uh, yeah, we're it's it's crazy to see how much the CPSN movement has transitioned over the past few years. So when I was a resident at Moose, Joe and Ashley were traveling all over the country, grassroots effort to get this thing going and and this really clinically enhanced services network, and so. Um, it's crazy now that it's almost 3,500 pharmacies. And what's really incredible, uh, especially through the COVID pandemic and some of the flip the pharmacy work, is just seeing everybody coming together and figuring things out and sharing these best practices with one another because we're all in it for the same reason. Number one, to, to help out our communities and also provide a sustainable future while providing care for patients. And so um, it's really incredible. And I think that was one of the humbling parts about the the pandemic is just seeing everybody come together and just for the greater good and, and sharing all these best practices. And here's a problem. How do we figure it out? And people just standing up for the cause. Yeah. So independent pharmacy really, you know, is kind of at a point where 
they're being tapped on the shoulder by larger entities, um, you know, saying, hey, can this group help? And this group of independent pharmacies absolutely can, but there needs to be, you know, some collaboration uh, for that to work for a bigger cause. And I, th I think that's what's really so important about CPESN is being able to provide that kind of technical support and accountability and, you know, there's there's somebody in your state. So when you join CPESN, and how many states are there currently? Uh, there let me put are, you on the spot. I know. I think you uh, <laughs> you really are. Uh, Forty seven, I believe. Yeah, most most states have a CPESN network, and so you have somebody there who is knowledgeable of, you know. Here's how we've seen other pharmacies do it in your in your state, and that that collaboration is. So, so, so important. Yeah, it, it helps a lot. And it, it is just coming together to show the value a, as a whole group. And that's the challenge is that we're all named differently for a great reason, right? But then from a payer's, payer's view, they want to see us as CPSN or a network of pharmacies so that then they could sign a single contract or something like that to make it as easy as possible. And that's what we've done. And that's what's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic vaccine uh, program is that if you if you didn't have X number of pharmacies, then you couldn't even sign up with the CDC to be involved with it. So I think that concept is just being brought to light even more these days. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And like I said, the, uh, you know, the, the process of being paid for what you're doing really relies on having a process of quantifying and, and standardizing uh, those efforts. And so we've seen that with, you know, e-care plans where pharmacies are able to kind of say, hey, here's the playbook, right? Like, here's how we quantify that care. And then we're actually seeing pharmacies getting paid for what they do. So what's going on in that realm? Uh, I, I see all kinds of, you know, every so often we have a new feature come out where CPESN has added a new payer to the network. Um, what is CPS doing to facilitate pharmacies getting paid? How does that work? Yeah, so there's currently 62 active payer programs across different regions and a, a few that are national programs. And so what CPSN is doing um, to help facilitate that is, number one, share the value of what all the great stuff these pharmacies are doing to the payer so that they understand this model because it's still very foreign to payers because they're used to working with the medical side of things. And so now they're thinking about pharmacies a lot differently. And, and after they get past that part, it becomes, okay, how do we implement this? So the pharmacies have great tools out there for documenting e-care plans if that's the route the payer is going, um, including uh, you guys at Pioneer have a, a great e-care plan system uh, for documentation of those things. And so what we do is develop out the implementation guides to say, here's what the payer wants and here's how you, a stepwise approach of implementing this within your workflow. Um, some of these things are, are services that pharmacies are already doing, but then one of the newer ones that's focused on behavioral health screenings, um, all pharmacies may not be doing a depression or anxiety screening with their patients every single day. So we're trying to provide the resources to do this in an efficient manner and then also document it so you can get paid for it and then ultimately improve the patient's care. And so that, that way the contracts keep going and everything. And and then, of course, we have great technology partners out there, Pioneer Rx being one of them, that are really helping pharmacies and stepping up to the table in order to make sure that um, they have the resources they need to, to submit the e-care plans or navigate a workflow issue. Um, so everybody's coming together for the greater good here, which is nice. Yeah, so there's that drive, you know. Um, uh to practice at the top of your license, right? Like I want to be able to maximize my impact. I'm going to do, you know, right up to what uh, we're allowed. And, and as that, that ceiling is raised, that team is ready to move forward and, and fill that opportunity. And CPSN is really kind of pushing pharmacies in that same 
that that same mindset. Push your pharmacy to the the top of its license, and so that when you do get provider status in your state, when you do get that new payment model, when you do get those new opportunities, you're you're queued up and ready to roll. Um, and that's so important. So the other side of that is, you know, there's a there's a, a technical barrier there. There's there's training. There's uh, support that needs to happen. How do you hold your team accountable? And so CPESN goes a step further even with the uh, Flipped Pharmacy program uh, that kind of provides us. Tell me a little bit about Flipped Pharmacy. This is one of the things that if you're listening and you haven't heard of Flipped the Pharmacy, uh, you know, turn it up or at least uh, put a marker in this so you can say, uh, you know, send this to your friend and say, hey, start it, uh, you know, 42 minutes in and listen. <laughs> But because this is one of the most exciting things that is available, I think, for independent pharmacies right now. Yeah. So Flip the Pharmacy is a really, really exciting initiative to transform practices. And so a lot of people, they're wanting to move forward and practice at the top of their license and have new workflows and make the ones they have more efficient. But it's where do I start with that? And so what Flip the Pharmacy does is take take these different services and takes a health condition, for instance, like hypertension, and makes um, makes this model of following a patient over time something that's very practical and not just something that we're focused at a moment in time, which is one of the slogans uh, with Flip the Pharmacy, not just focusing on a moment in time, but longitudinal care for the patient. And so what we do through these various change packages, which is uh, just step-by-step guides on how to engage your staff, how to implement something into workflow, share best practices of what other peers are doing to make this work so that it's not like a unicorn. Everybody is getting on board with this and doing it. And so we start out again with the appointment-based model as being the fundamental aspect to it and then following up with the patients, focusing on non-pharmacist support staff roles, because that's going to, as we get into more services, it's going to be so important for again, everybody to be doing everything that they are legally able to do. And so that's a huge portion is something that we're going to be focusing on even more within Flip the Pharmacy in the next year or two. Um, and then you've got coordination of care of making sure we're finding out these problems with the patients. But how do we communicate this to the prescribers to make sure that there's a resolution to a medication related problems that we a problem that we may find? And then ultimately, how do we document this within our workflow? So, Will, you said it really nicely of just getting your pharmacy prepared for this next wave of being recognized differently within the marketplace. And in order to do that, we've got to have our workflows ready to go. We've got to have our staff ready to go, or else we're going to have all kinds of pressures on us to succeed whenever we could be slowly getting there at this point and refining all of our different processes. And when the opportunity comes along, then we can move forward with it and succeed out the gate rather than uh, uh, not having as quick of a response in the beginning and then taking your time to get everything in, into play to, to provide opportunities and share the data back with the payers. So Flip the Pharmacy is meant to focus on all of those different aspects and really a, a great learning collaborative that's very practical in nature. And that's been the biggest focus on it is we don't want something to, produced out there that you can't do. Like that's just too pie in the sky. We want it something that you can actually implement and then you can be sustained throughout time. Yeah. And that's, that's what's so exciting about the flip the pharmacy program is that it's so practical and, you know, you have training elements from industry professionals from many different arenas, bringing that content in. And it's like real case studies, like, Hey, this example is going to go through this and this and this and this. And really like, like I said, it's, it, it's not theoretical anymore. You're seeing a, a practical use, um, like workshop. So yeah. And pharmacy are getting exciting. paid for these services like that, that are being, uh, reviewed within the flip the pharmacy material. So that's why it's so important to go ahead and start through this practice transformation journey so that whenever you do have a payer, you're ready to go out the gate. Yeah. CPESN, uh, flip the pharmacy specifically are those points where, you know, any pharmacist who's ever said, Oh, reimbursements need to improve. And we need to be paid for what we're doing. Um, 
I would say here's your chance is, you know, you, you have to, uh, you know, you, you have to take part. Um, the exciting thing is, you know, that's going to be, um, you know, it, it's kind of a point in time that I think 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and pharmacy school, they're going to talk about the pharmacists who are practicing at the top of their licenses now. And, and you know, these landmark uh, decisions that have changed the the landscape of pharmacy and pharmacists today are really poised to have an impact. And that that's super exciting. Yeah, it really is. And and now I'm seeing some schools schools and colleges of pharmacies take this model of, of flip the pharmacy and wanting to connect their student pharmacists with advanced experiences at community pharmacies that are following along with this type of initiative because it is really setting the trajectory of what we're going to be seeing in the in the future. And at some point this is going to be common practice. Uh, so that we can sustain our our businesses and practices with the patients. Yeah, exciting stuff, man. It is. It's a. It's definitely incredible to be involved with it. It's uh, very honoring, but also at the same time, it's just incredible to see the great work that people are doing, and then us having the ability to share that out so that other people can move forward with um, those same practices within their pharmacy. Yeah. Before I let you go, um, are there any like specific payment models or payment programs that you can kind of talk about uh, briefly as an example? Like, hey, here's here's a program that we just launched where pharmacists are getting paid for this in this state. Like, uh, can you share some of those success stories or if you have one that's currently in the works that you can talk about? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple that comes to mind. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the behavioral health program and doing those screenings for uh, seeing how well controlled depression or anxiety is for their patients and then communicating that to uh, prescribers in case additional therapy needs to be brought on board or if maybe that dosage needs to be increased or maybe they're good to go and we're just checking up on the patient. So that's one of the payer programs that is currently happening that's being submitted by an e-care plan. One of the, uh, another payer program that's happening, which is kind of outside of the normal medication aspect is social determinants of health. So this is something that we're going to be seeing a lot more. It's kind of a buzzword right now and people are trying to figure out what it is, but it's really focusing on um, all those things outside of medication that we can make an impact on. So we see people that may be struggling financially. Um, how do we connect them with assistance? If they have food insecurities, how do we connect them with food? Because if they don't have food, they're not going to be worried about their medications. So um, a couple states have a program going right now where they're working with case managers or social workers. So they're identifying these opportunities um, for the mutual members and then they're communicating back through the e-care plan different opportunities that these case managers can connect with the patient, such as food insecurities or transportation issues or housing issues or something even more serious or minor. So just a whole plethora of things that pharmacies can identify just knowing that pharmacy that patients are going to the pharmacy so much. There's like a great relationship. How do we take that information and pass that over to a payer where they can connect them with somebody on their team to help resolve for that issue and ultimately improve the whole outcomes of the patients. So that's occurring in a couple states right now, and it's going to be interesting to see how that grows. But I think that's a really cool thing that you don't really think about pharmacists doing and working with case managers that closely in such an organic way, but it's happening out there now. And so it's really exciting to see that happening and also getting paid for it. So yeah, that's the cool yeah. part. What, what's so amazing is if you, you corner any uh, independent pharmacist and say, tell me a story about a patient, you know, that like, you know, where you've made a difference, they they can just rattle off so many of, of these. And social determinants of health, we, we kind of, of course, it has to have a, a title in order to have a code, <laughs> you know, um, but bef before that, it's just independent pharmacies knowing their patients, you know, it's, it's what independent pharmacies do. Um, but they have to be able to share that story. Yep. It's all about sharing the story and the data. That's so important. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to let you get back to work. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, definitely want to talk to you again in the future and hear about, uh, what's going on now out 
while you're back on the West Coast or East Coast, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I know you're going to have some exciting stuff uh, in no time. So, yeah, Will, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being a guest on your podcast. It's still great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Scripts, presented by the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please support our channel by liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so that you'll be notified anytime we post new content. To stay up to date with all of the latest independent pharmacy news and content, follow Pioneer RX on your preferred social media platform.